use the divergence theorem to compute the net outward flux of the vector field f is equal to minus x for y minus z across the surface S, where S is the boundary of the tetrahedron in the first octant formed by the plane, z is equal to 1 minus x minus y. So given this vector field F, which is defined as minus x for y minus z, let's use this to compute the divergence. So we know that the divergence of the vector field is equal to the dot product of the del operator and our vector field. So we have the del operator with components d dx, d dy, d dz. And we're dotting this with our given vector field, minus x, 4y, minus z. And so by the dot product, we have the derivative of minus x with respect to x, plus the derivative of 4y with respect to y, plus the derivative of minus z with respect to z, leaving us with minus 1 plus 4 minus 1, which gives us 2. So we have another constant for the divergence of our vector field here. So let's think about what is our solid region D? Do we have a geometric formula for it? So our solid region is a tetrahedron in the first octant. So it is, and it's bounded by the surface, right, those x, y, and z planes, as well as the plane, z is equal to 1 minus x minus y. So we don't have a simple geometric formula for this, but we can easily find the bound. So to find these bounds, we want to go ahead and sketch this. So we are sketching our tetrahedron. Again, we'll keep in mind here that this is bounded by the surface S defined explicitly by z is equal to 1 minus x minus y in the first octant. So that's where x is greater than or equal to 0, y is greater than or equal to 0, and z is greater than or equal to 0. So let's think about space. We have the z-axis, we have the x-axis, and scooch that over a little bit, and we have the y-axis. So we need to find the intercepts using our given surface so that we can see the tetrahedron. So let's think, Where, what is the x-intercept of this plane? So if we let y and z be 0, we're left with 0 is equal to 1 minus x. So therefore, we have an x-intercept at 1, say so right about there. What about the y-intercept? Well, if we let x and z be equal to 0, we're left with 0 is equal to 1 minus y. And so therefore, we see that we have a y-intercept at 1. We could say right about there. And last but not least, we have the z-intercept. So if we let x and y be equal to 0, then we're left with z is equal to 1. Woohoo! So there are our three intercepts. And if we connect these three intercepts with a smooth curve, we can see our surface S. So here is our surface S. Again, we're bounded by the coordinate planes. So we want to think, what are the bounds on this solid region D in R3? So here is our solid region D, and we know it's bounded above by the plane Z is equal to 1 minus X minus Y, and it's bounded below by the xy plane. So that's defined as z is equal to 0. And we can even shade this region here because it's going to be important. So using this again, we, have, we are bounded above by the plane. Z is equal to 1 minus x minus y and bounded below by the xy plane. So we have the bounds on z. We have that z is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 1, minus x, minus y. 
But what about the bounds on x and y? So in order to determine those bounds, we want to think about the region R in the xy plane. So in other words, you want to think about the projection that this solid is casting into the xy plane. And we can see that looking at our solid, the sketch of our solid region here, we can see that it's going to be a right triangle with intercepts at 1 for both x and y. So here is that region in the xy plane. Now we can see that this region is bounded below by the x-axis, or y is equal to 0. And it's bounded on the left-hand side by the y-axis, or x is equal to 0. But what is the hypotenuse of this right triangle? So if we're in the xy plane, z must be 0. So since z is equal to 0, we can use our surface S here to find that diagonal line. So we can say that the surface becomes 0 is equal to 1 minus x minus y. And converting this to its slope-intercept form, we see that the diagonal line is y is equal to 1 minus x. So we can erase our question mark and say that this hypotenuse is defined by the diagonal line 1 minus x. And so we can see all of the bounds here. Before you state them, you always want to make sure to take your pencil and simply run it across that region R to make sure that the top and bottom curve always remain the same. And we can see that that holds true here. The top curve is always the hypotenuse, and the bottom curve is always going to be that x-axis. So we can say that, therefore, x is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 1, and y is always greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 1 minus x. And so we have everything that we need. We've got the x and y bounds, we have the z-bounds, and we have the divergence. So with these three components, we are officially ready to evaluate the triple integral of the divergence theorem. And so we're ready to evaluate the divergence theorem. So we have that triple integral over the solid region D of the divergence of the vector field, and we're integrating with respect to volume. So plugging in what we just found, the outer integral is the x-bound, so that's from 0 to 1. The middle integral is the y-bound, so that's from 0 to 1 minus x. And the inner integral is our z-bounds, which is 0 to 1 minus x minus y. And we had the divergence of our vector field was 2. And that is dz, dy, dx. So here we go. We have the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 1 to x, and we're integrating with respect to z first, so this becomes 2z from 0 to 1 minus x minus y dy dx. And so this will become the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 0 to 1 minus x of 2 multiplied by 1 minus x minus y dy dx. And so we're ready now to integrate with respect to y. So this will become, keeping the outer integral on the outside, we have the integral 0 to 1 of 2. And we can even think about this as 1 minus x multiplied by y minus y squared over 2 and we're evaluating from 0 to 1 minus x dx. So evaluating, we are left with, I'm going to actually put, just to make this a little bit nicer, let's put 2 on the outside of our integral for now. All right, so we're plugging in 1 minus x. So I have 1 minus x multiplied by 1 minus x minus 1 minus x squared all over 2. 
and then when we plug zero in, everything disappears. So that's just minus zero. So are you noticing here that we have one minus x times one minus x, which is of course one minus x squared. So we have like terms here and we can combine this so that we're left with two times the integral from zero to one of one minus x squared all over two dx. And our twos cancel each other right out. Woohoo! And so we have a basic u substitution, or even we can just call this a general antiderivative. This is going to integrate to minus one minus x cubed all over three from zero to one. If you didn't see that general antiderivative, you can always apply u substitution here as well. And we're ready to evaluate. So I have minus one third multiplied by one, so I have one minus one cubed, minus zero minus, or excuse me, one minus zero cubed. So one minus one, of course, goes to zero. And then we have, or we're left with, negative one third multiplied by negative one, which leaves us with a beautiful final answer of one third.